Thank you, Carolyn, and uh, thank you all for being willing to listen to us for three and a half hours with a couple of breaks. Um, I guess we'll gauge the success of this by seeing if this crowd is as thick as it is right now. At the end of it. Um, also, in an effort to deflect or assign blame, um, Carolyn and I were talking yesterday. Uh, I was thanking her for organizing this, and, and uh, I said, "Whose idea was it?" And uh, she said, "Well, it was it was Salmon's idea because he said you had to hook up with the beer." <laughs> I said, oh, I got it. Okay, so the, the lesson behind all of this is don't drink any beer that you don't like. So if you don't like it, you don't have to play with us. Um, you, you also don't have to drink any, any more of that Shawnee IPA tonight. We'll take it all home. Uh, the, uh, and, I, and I should mention that... Uh, 2% of the sales of that Shelly goes to Flint River Keeper, and it's now available all over Georgia, I'm told. But don't drink any beer you don't like. Drink, uh, drink whatever you like, and just recognize the fact that at some level, we're all at this cocktail party together. Um, so thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, Steve, and thank all of you for listening. Uh, what the hell is a river keeper? Well, it's a... Uh, it's important in most um, stories to start at the beginning, and I'll take about probably three minutes to explain it. It's interesting, everybody comes to, and I was, I was speaking with uh, Jordan and Kat and um, Kylie, I'm sorry I can't remember your name, the fellow that's working on the map for us. Um, I can't remember your name, but I was speaking last night. Uh, over those beers. And I said, we all come to the water hole. We all have to come to the water hole. You remember, you remember the photographs you've seen of a uh, large diversity of species of uh, African plains animals coming to dried up rivers. Some of you may remember the Frederick Remington print where these white guys are defending the water hole against some Native Americans that are circling. And this, these, these, uh, these photographs, these images elevate and at least in my mind, the importance of water to all of us. It's, it's interesting to talk, to, to have that conversation with people that are completely unaware of it. I don't need to tell that to a bunch of fisheries folks. Uh, fish have to have water. Um, there's no fishery without water. There's no, we haven't, you know, I guess other than a video game. Um, you're not, you're not gonna, um, you're just not gonna do that. And so that, that's the lens and that's the angle that I come at Riverkeeping through. And it's interesting, the history of it. Um, in the 1960s, the Hudson River was experiencing two problems. One, the lower end of it was so polluted that um, the, the stocks were literally, literally crashing, not from overfishing, but from poor water quality. And they had lost their market at the Fulton Fish Market for the oilier fishes like the, like the shad. Um, because of the taste that was in the flesh. And the commercial fishing community, which was uh, mostly um, working class, conservative, blue collar Democrats, when that was a thing, uh, were extremely frustrated with their government um, and, and the lack of, of the government's attention to these water quality issues. And meanwhile, on the upper Hudson, a group of very wealthy Republicans um, blue blood, blue collar. Um, we're looking at a situation with a, a mountain called Storm King and a proposed dam at the Storm King Mountain. If any of you have ever been to the U.S. Military Academy at West Point and you stood at the battery at the Military Academy and looked upstream, that's the mountain that you're looking at. If it hadn't been for um, river keepers or what became river keepers, there would be a dam there today. And their issue was that hundreds and hundreds of miles of Blue Ribbon trout water were going to be inundated by, by that reservoir. And there was one guy, he wrote for Sports Illustrated, never can remember his last name, maybe somebody can scream it out, his first name was Bob. And he did, he did a whole bunch of writing about fishing all over the planet for Sports <coughs> Illustrated. There actually was a time when that kind of thing was in Sports Illustrated. 
Uh, he had a foot in both camps, and he got these people together. They formed something called the Hudson River Fishermen's Association. And it went under that name for 20 years. It was later renamed Riverkeeper. And they hired professional staff. They called the lead staff person the Riverkeeper. That was, the, that was the, the job title. And they began to use the law and change the law to clean up their river and to prevent um, bad, destructive problems from happening. And today, when you go to the Hudson River, the species diversity and the aquatic productivity is some of the best on the planet, particularly considering the urbanized nature of that watershed. And there is no dam at Storm King, and the trout fishing um, is, is still there. The business model worked. They listened to their river, which means listening to the people that are using the river. And they used existing law and changed the law. Remember, there was no clean water act in the late 1960s. They were actually part of the impetus for getting the Clean Water Act passed uh, in the early 70s. Um, and so that, that's the riverkeeper business model, is you, 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 you figure out what's wrong with your river, and usually the people are telling you. An instrument can tell you also. Your eyes can tell you sometimes. Uh, and then you work to correct those problems in the, within the existing legal structure. And if, and if the law doesn't suit you, you can be like any other citizen and get out there and try to change the law. And in a nutshell, that's what river keepers do. And we run the gamut politically. From the left to the right, uh, we have uh, uh, um, notable and sometimes notorious people like James Holland among our ranks. Uh, and it's, it's interesting to think about where he comes from. He was a Marine Corps sergeant. And if you think about that and the psychology of a Marine Corps sergeant, which is kill everything in front of you and take that hill with small flanking maneuvers, that sort of explains James Holland in, in a nutshell. And if you think about another river keeper who was on the Noose River, um, a retired Marine Corps colonel, much more strategic, his name is Rick Dove. Um, he organized um, the citizens in a, in a very cohesive way around the uh, hog farm mission in eastern North Carolina. He's retired, that fight still goes on today. But um, in both cases, this Marine Corps sergeant and this Marine Corps colonel put issues on the map, you know, in, in the public eye that were not there before and that began to um, foster change within their warship, positive change. Two totally different approaches to it. Uh, and here in Georgia, um, the, the granddaddy, or I should say maybe grandmama of, of them all was the Chattahoochee Riverkeeper in Atlanta. And the Chattahoochee River today is cleaned up downstream of Atlanta, and they're still working on it. It's not perfectly clean, but it is orders of magnitude cleaner because of the leadership of Chattahoochee Riverkeeper and the lawsuit that uh, held uh, the city of Atlanta and other discharges speak to the fire. So that's a, that's a thumbnail sketch of who Riverkeepers are, what they do, and we're really honored to be here. We're, we're really um, enjoying our conversations that we're having with y'all. Um, both last night and today, and we hope they continue into this evening. And um, we, we think, well, I, should, I guess I should say, I think, and I hope my colleagues think, that um, clean flowing water is critical to fishing, and that it's critical to everything else that we do too, literally. Uh, there's not a stock portfolio or a retirement account on this planet, um, or any community on this planet or any other function on this planet that is not directly connected to water somehow and for the, for the health and productivity of, of, of what it's trying to produce and indeed it's very survival. So this first session, uh, which we're going to try to end up at about 10 to 2, is going to uh, cover two of our different legislative issues. Um, uh, we're going to start with all of them, all river keepers, Jim Hilbert. You join me up here, and we're gonna. Um, she's going to be talking about coal ash, and then we're going to move into uh, the work that Chattahoochee Riverkeeper is doing, and some work that all of us are doing on trust funds, <coughs> presented in turn by Jess Sterling from 
Chattahoochee River Keeper, and by Jesse Demonbro Chapman. Did I pronounce that right? Yep. <laughs> okay, he'll pronounce it. When he gets uh, and I'll just call him Jesse because it's easier um, regarding environmental trust funds. So thank y'all for listening, and I'll, I'll get you teed up here. Well, thank you.